Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. You can find the entire back catalog there of over 100 episodes. Uh, again, I have here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks a lot for your time. Hey, Brock. How's it going? We haven't done one of these in a little while. We kind of kind of just gotten busy with some other things, I, I suppose. Yeah, no, it's had personal things, summer travel, all that sort of stuff. I moved. It's just it's been busy. Yeah, so. we still got still got a little more vacation coming up and whatnot. But we have like two or three of these queued up for the relatively near future, right? Yeah, yeah, we went on a little spat of uh, reaching out to people and setting up, um, you know, times to be able to have discussions with them and. You know, we're always looking for people who to, you know, go to the nomination form on the website at rce-cast.com and send us ideas for other topics and groups we should talk to. So if anyone yeah, so, has ideas, they should do that. Yeah, thanks for uh, bearing with us, all the fans out there. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, sorry for the bit of a, a hiatus we've had. But give us another couple of weeks here for summer vacations and whatnot, and then we'll then we'll be back in the swing of things. Um but I am excited, actually, to start off with who we got today. This is a guy I've known for quite a while. Um, he's been in the HPC community for uh, as long as I have, which is actually a very, very long time. Um, but amusingly enough, it didn't even occur to me until we started recording today. I'm at the Cisco Mothership today in uh, San Jose, California, and I could have driven up the road, literally, and we could have done this sitting in the same room. Um, sh- boo on me for not thinking of this ahead of time. But... Uh, let me introduce, we're going to be talking about Singularity today uh, with its founder, Greg Kurtzer. So, Greg, could you introduce yourself? Hey, guys. I'm Greg. Um, by the way, thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Uh, this is fantastic. And uh, you guys, how long have you guys been doing this for? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, man, I think it's coming up on, you know, five, six, seven years, something like that. I remember when you guys first started this, and I'm so happy to see you guys have been uh, just just uh, putting this out there and doing so much great for the community uh, with these podcasts. So thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. So as I mentioned, I'm Greg. I'm an HPC architect and developer for Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, I've had some experience creating various open source projects in the community, uh, some of which some people uh, may be familiar with. Uh, probably the biggest one is CentOS Linux. Um, I'm the primary founder of CentOS Linux, although there were, there were some other co-founders involved as well, but, uh, I was running the, uh, organization that, that created it, uh, also Werewolf and Singularity most recently. So Singularity is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so can you give us a quick overview of what Singularity is? Sure thing. So Singularity is a container system. So uh, I can give a little story, actually, to, I think, of how Singularity came to be. So in doing HPC for the national labs, uh, we, we've always had a lot of scientists that were, would always come to us with their, with their code. And uh, whether it be Fortran or C, they, they really bragged on how efficient their code was and how uh, portable it was. And they wanted accounts running it on everywhere that you can imagine just to basically make sure that A, it compiled and B, it was faster than heck. So the scientists would, I mean, that, that was the environment that I came from. The scientists would, would uh, relish the fact of how portable their source code was. So then we started working more with the university and the university is, is much more, uh, I guess you could say forward thinking and they're doing more of the current trends and moving more into the uh, new wave of, of how people are doing things. And what we found is that they wanted to uh, not just build a binary and have that portable, but they basically owned and built an entire uh, operating system image, a container, if you will, that basically described and had within it all of their libraries, all of their scripts that they needed, all of the workflow uh, and everything that they wanted. And they have it running possibly on their laptop or possibly on their workstation. And when we started working with the university, they asked us, they said, so we, we've already got an image or we got it running on this workstation. And I don't want to rebuild everything that I've already done. And you guys aren't even running a similar environment. So can you just run this over there? And that was really the first time I th- really started thinking about containers. And uh, it, it's, it's an interesting problem to solve. All right, so hold on a second. What is what is a container? What is the difference? 
friends with containers and virtual machines? Oh, that's a really good question. So a virtual machine basically is running a application which is going to uh, virtualize another computer. And then on top of that virtualization of another computer, you're running another kernel. You're running another um, uh, user land. And then on top of that, you're going to run a whole nother um, level of applications. And the distance between those applications and the physical hardware compared to the applications running natively on that physical hardware is a much greater distance. And as a result, you're going to get a lot uh, slower uh, runs and you're going to get higher latencies and whatnot. There's a lot of things they do to, to, to make it faster and whatnot, but let's not go into that right now. Containers, on the other hand, the applications that run within a container system are running basically at the same distance from the physical hardware as native applications. And as a result, they're going to run much faster, much more efficient. So probably the best known implementation of using containers on Linux is Docker. Um, How does Singularity, you know, why don't I just use Docker on my system? How does Singularity versus Docker kind of compare? Ah, great question. So Docker is kind of the de facto container solution out there. When people think of containers, uh, that's what they that's what they typically think of. And for good reason. I mean, it didn't pioneer the idea of containers. Um, Containers existed for a much longer uh, period of time than than Docker has. But Docker has done a lot to do things like. Um, bringing um, the entire workflow of building containers, sharing containers with your friends, family, and neighbors, and um, leveraging that work of your uh, of your peers to extend that and build additional containers, and then run it. So they they've basically brought a whole ecosystem of um, a workflow together. So there's definitely there's a lot of validity in using uh, Docker and HPC resources. So the question is really, why aren't we doing that? And if you if you look at how long Docker's been around, let's say approximately about two years, and ever since then, um, excuse me, at least uh, from the scientific perspective, about two years, and so far there's not really been one HPC center that's been able to do it. There's a huge number of complexities in installing Docker into a multi-tenant shared HPC environment. And as a result of that, I can go into any of the specifics that you want, but at a high level, uh, you could see, I mean, we're going on years now and scientists have been, been banging down our doors trying to get Docker installed, but it hasn't been, it hasn't been done yet. Uh, and, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons for that, but uh, yeah, installing Docker on an HPC resource really would have been, uh, the, the, the easy win. But can't right, do well, it. well, give us some examples. What are the complexities of it? Because it's marketed, um, and I know a lot of my friends who are in the web development types of community, web applications kind of community, they swear by Docker, and they love Docker, and that is inherently a multi-tenant community, and they put all of their applications in Docker. So what's different between that and HPC types of environments? Okay. Uh, let's start off with, uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can we can approach this problem. So let's start off with the fact that it's running as a daemon. So the, when when the Docker um, process runs, it's actually running as a root owned daemon. And for users to spawn jobs in Docker, they're basically communicating over a socket uh, and at, from, with a command line tool, and they're basically instructing that daemon what to do. So let's talk about this from a from a scheduler perspective. So if I were to go and submit a job to um, to a cluster, to an HPC resource, the resource manager and the scheduler would work together to figure out, well, what what size allocation do I get? Um, where is it going to go? And um, and they're going to let me run on that. Now, if I if I ask for a job that says, give me a, a, a wall clock time of, of five minutes on one processor, and then I run a job and my job goes over that five minutes, what's going to happen? It's going to get killed. And the resource manager is basically going to say, you've exceeded your allocation, so it's killing it. So no problem. Now, in the Docker community, the Docker um, perspective, what you end up with is uh, the user application or the user command line that communicates with that daemon is going to tell that daemon, okay, well, here's the job I want you to run. Now, they could detach from that daemon, and that job just goes off and runs on the end. And even if that client program gets killed at that point, it's not stopping the, the, the Docker daemon from continuous, continuously running that job. So what you end up with is the Docker daemon is outside the reach of the scheduler. And that basically means that you can't 
um, properly schedule or deal with the resource management of uh, containers running under that daemon. Now, there's a whole bunch of, as I mentioned, a whole bunch of reasons why Docker is really not geared towards HPC. The web world and the enterprise world, uh, that's really its bread and butter. And that's what it was designed to do. Uh, there's been a few patches that have addressed some of the issues within the Docker um, uh, ecosystem. And that would make it better for HPC. And those uh, patches, at least many of them, have not been accepted. Some of them are almost about a year old at this point, been pending. So you can see that this really isn't in the uh, interest of the of, of the Docker developers. This is not the, the primary use case that they're looking for. It's probably not even a secondary or tertiary or even tangential use case that they're looking to, to solve. And as a result of that, um, it's been very difficult to get the necessary changes for, for HPC uh, involved. And th there's other aspects as well. I mean, the complexities of dealing with MPI, the complexities of dealing with GPUs. Um, NVIDIA has taken a stab at it, and it's been pretty good, but there's still a lot of complexities there. Um, and uh, security as well. Uh, one other point, if you don't mind me mentioning real quick, is within a Docker container, uh, let's say, for example, I have a Docker container that I want to run in and that I own, and I, you know, I, I want to get root. So I know what the root password is. Now, there's lots of ways of getting root, but let's just assume that I set the root password. Let's go the easiest way. When I submit my job up to the, when I submit my Docker container and, you know, the Docker daemon's running that, well, I can easily escalate up to root. In that particular case, uh, what do I have access to do? Well, it depends now. It comes down to what namespaces are involved and how is the, how's the Docker daemon and the underlying operating system dealing with that? Is the user namespace separated out or not? And what you end up with, though, is you end up with, I'm able to escalate up to another user privilege, possibly. And in that case, where does that leave the security of the system? I mean, if I've got, you know, storage that has um, data from other users that I should not be able to see, or I'm, if I'm on a public or, or, or rather the, um, the, the shared network of my HPC resource, I don't necessarily want a root user on that. So there's other mitigations that people need to take into place, and they start bisecting the network and bisecting the InfiniBand fabric and, and saying that Docker containers then don't have access to the file systems, and you end up with a small little virtual cluster in your big cluster, and that's not the problem that we want to solve. Okay, so you pointed out a lot of things there, and you know, like you said, Docker kind of aims on one thing, but Docker is still very popular even among a lot of scientific codes, especially things that are kind of like one node or less, like small analytics codes. And you can package everything up, which makes things really nice for distribution in terms of you know reproducibility. It's exactly the way the developer made it, which is one of the huge benefits of all these container setups. Singularity can you take a Docker container and turn it into a Singularity container? Yes, you can. This is one of the workflows that I've been um, uh, pushing forth with several other people. So the, the idea is that, um, and as you said, you know, a lot of people already have experience with Docker, and they are already built these workflows using Docker files and, uh, and implementation with Docker. So one one workflow um, that I think is really good is people use Docker to create their, um, their, their, their containers and to build them and to develop with them because it's a known technology. And from that, when they're ready to take it to a larger center, to an HPC center or into a bigger resource, they basically do a Docker export. Now, Docker export uh, basically dumps a particular uh, format and very coincidentally, Singularity imports that exact same format. So you could basically do a Docker export pipe, Singularity import. Okay, so we kind of skipped an important question though about, you know, we talked about what the, the shortcomings are of Docker in a HPC environment. Uh, how is Singularity better? Like what did you d design in terms of how Singularity is both implemented and intended to be used that would make it suitable for an HPC environment? Ah, that's a good question. So Singularity does a lot of things differently than Docker. So one of them, for example, is you are the same user inside the container as you are outside the container. And as a result of that, you can blur the line between what is actually contained. So for example, uh, if on the host, 
I have access to particular directories and particular device files, and um, I am, uh, have access to a certain amount of resources on that particular host. Well, if I'm running inside of a container, there's no reason why I shouldn't still have access to those exact same resources. Granted, I need to virtualize my environment a little bit. So um, I'm running my own libc. I'm running my own um, uh, any other programs I've installed into that environment. But I can blur that line between what is container and what is host. So, for example, very easily I can say the scratch file system should be available inside the container. The home directory, my home directory, should be available inside the container. And as a result of that, when you actually invoke a singularity, uh, let's say shell command into a container, what you actually, what it feels like you're doing, it feels like you're actually SSHing into a node running a completely different operating system, but you still have, happen to have all of the same file system shared to that node. All right. Now, I, I thought I saw something else about the, the format, too, about how you actually store and uh, move the containers around. Is there something different about that as well? Yes, there is. So Singularity uses a single file image to represent the container and all of the files there in the container. So this can be a file that I as a user own, but it's a single file. And if I wanted you to have access to that, it's simply a matter of changing the POSIX permissions on that file so you can actually get access to it. Or we can just copy it over to your home directory and branch it in a matter of speaking. So there's certain advantages from having it as a file um, versus what Docker's doing. And I'll mention what Docker's doing in just a second. So as a single file, um, if I were to put this, let's say, for example, on my Lustre file system, and I run Singularity um, with the image on the Lustre file system, and I run a gigantic parallel uh, MPI command against that, that single file. Well, let's say inside I'm running a, a Python job, uh, PyMPI. Now, the number of file opens that are necessary um, within, the, w within doing a big, huge Pi MPI job uh, is actually huge. And those are all metadata operations that's happening to your parallel file system. And I've seen – I've heard some numbers that have stated that to run a really big Python MPI job, it can take upwards of 20 to 30 minutes of a distributed denial of service attack on your metadata server for your parallel file system. That's just to start the job. Now, with Singularity, because we're using a single image, it doesn't matter how many file opens occur within that image. It's still just one metadata lookup on your, on your parallel file system metadata server. So as far as uh, implementing a big, huge parallel job of something like Python that has lots of opens, um, file opens underneath the hood going on, you can actually get speed ups as a result of using uh, singularity. Docker, on the other hand, uses uh, basically every every node that will be running a Docker job has to cache that uh, file system locally. And what that means is it's going to cache and then rebuild that the entire image, the entire container image for each node that needs to run that job. So if you need to run a whole bunch of um, HTC or MPC type jobs, um, you're going to get quite a bit of startup overhead that you're going to incur just for starting um, the job. Where in Singularity, it's really tuned for parallel runs, um, especially using a parallel file system. Yeah, actually, if you, if you go back to our episode for Pi MPI, they, they talked about on like large blue gene systems, how things would lock up and they were trying to do all these things. So that's really quite interesting um, doing that thing. So in this setup, Am I still basically bringing my entire environment though? Like, am I bringing like my own glibc and stuff like that? If I'm against a version different than what my host platform is running on, like I, I still get all of that isolation of what I'm running, except for the kernel. Yes, it is exactly that. You are getting um, the complete isolation, pretty much except for the kernel, which brings its own level of complexities and things that have to be mitigated. But for the most part, um, you're right. Your C library, and I also have to get out of the habit of saying glibc now because there's there's more libcs than just GNU um, and uh, Alpine Linux, for example, is using muscle libc. Um, but the libc itself. Uh, is completely independent inside your container than what you're running on the host. Now, there is some libc to kernel 
um, uh, compatibility that needs to occur. And you may do something like, for example, if you want to run a Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 container on a Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5 kernel, it's basically just not going to run because the libc is not compatible with that kernel. But you can go the other direction. You can run a Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5 uh, container on a Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 host, and that works just fine. So how how do I integrate this with my batch system, though? I mean, I have to... Do I still have a JavaScript? Do Is my JavaScript like my equivalent of my command, the container starts on boot, or... And I can do all this just as part of a specially crafted batch script, or do I need support in my batch scheduler? Good question. The, the architecture and the original design of Singularity was trying to make it so simple for a user to run a command that's inside of a container as it is to run a, a job or a command that's outside the container. So from a user perspective, they can just, let's say, for example, they have the program, you know, FUBAR. And they can run this program FUBAR on their host if it exists, or they can run it inside the container if they if if it exists there. So if they want to run it on the host, obviously if it's in path, you just say FUBAR. Uh, if you want to run it inside of a Singularity container, you basically just prefix that command with Singularity. We're going to exec exec uh, a program that exists inside of a particular container. So then we pass the path of the container file or the container image itself. And then we basically pass the command foobar, hit enter, and it'll actually run foobar from within that container. So because of this workflow, which is really designed to emulate what is it like to run uh, on a standard, you know, on a standard host and a standard shell and run any of those commands, you can basically put the singularity command itself inside of your batch script now and run the command then with no run the container excuse me with no changes architectural or otherwise to the host system so for a service provider an hpc uh, uh, provider it just means that we need to install singularity on the nodes of our compute uh, compute cluster now, when the users come along and they want to run a job, they simply just add those singularity lines inside the batch script whenever they want to reference a particular uh, container that they want to utilize. So integration is incredibly simple. Now, how do I – you talked before about I can make a Docker container and easily convert that to a singularity container. But are there other ways to natively create a singularity container because – Usually, I would imagine you want to have that command actually inside uh, the container along with whatever other support apparatus that it needs, specific libraries and shell scripts and other environment kinds of things like that. How does one typically do that? So I think you're asking how to um, – what I call bootstrap an image from scratch, which is basically to build up a new image using Singularity as the, the bootstrap um, mechanism. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Okay. So – in that case, Singularity does offer um, bootstrapping functionality. And the way that it offers it is um, it's basically a two-step process. And it'll probably end up becoming a one-step process soon enough. But at the moment, it's a two-step. You basically create your container image with one command. So it would be uh, literally Singularity, create, and then give it an image path. And it'll create the image. Um, once that's done, then you do a Singularity bootstrap. You point it at that image. And then you pass it a definition file. And the definition file is a fairly simple syntax that basically says, okay, this is a Debian or um, Red Hat based system. And I want to install from this particular mirror of packages. And um, this is what I want it to look like. Here are the packages and files that I want it to install. And I can copy files or install files from my current directory or um, um, download files and put them into the container uh, all basically within this definition file. So then, as I mentioned, two commands, the create command and then the bootstrap command. So when you run singularity bootstrap, point it at an image and then give it the definition file, it'll go off and install a new operating system into that image. And it'll copy and install any programs or scripts that you want into that image. But you don't have to, you don't have to do everything within a definition file. So for example, you can as root go into that container image, 
Um, something I mentioned before is you are whatever user you are inside the container as you are outside the container. Um, and there's certain blocks necessary uh, or in place so a user cannot escalate up to root within a container. Um, but so if you want to be root inside your container, you actually first have to be root outside your container. So start up singularity by going, let's say, sudo singularity shell. Um, we want to make this, this container um, uh, writable for this instance. So you pass the minus W option and then you give it the path. Once you do that, you can do yum install or apt get install or anything else that you want to do within that container. And then as soon as you exit out of that shell, all of the changes are automatically flushed to the image and there's no rebuild time or anything like that. So it's, um, the image is always up to date. Okay, so we created an image. And you said we can just run simple commands inside our normal batch script, and all we have to do is install Singularity. What does that actually mean for a system administrator group like mine? Are we talking about, is this kernel modules? Does it just use LXC, and it's just a couple of scripts and helper utilities that really just make LXC fit for human consumption? Is it? Do we have to rebuild against every kernel release? What? How bad is it for an admin to maintain Singularity on their platform? Oh, it's very easy. Um, there's no kernel components to it. Um, it pretty much is all interfacing um, at user land level. So um, there's nothing you need to deal with as far as updating um, and whatnot. And it's not using LXC or anything else on the back end. It's all brand new code. Um, it's written primarily in C. Uh, there's a few shell script wrappers that just basically go around the the end pieces of it just to make sure everything is sane before it calls the the binary components behind. But at that point, what it's basically doing is it's it's dealing with the namespaces in the kernel, um, not as a kernel module, but calling those via system calls. And um, and yeah, once it's installed, you're pretty much done. Um, when you build it, um, the configure script will automatically figure out what capabilities your host has. So for example, if you don't have access to um, you know, the user namespace, it's not going to leverage the user namespace code. Okay, so let, let's dig a little deeper here. How does this translate into the HPC realm in the area that I personally care about a lot is the MPI, right? So you've got some kind of high-speed networking stack uh, that you want to use uh, what does Singularity do or intentionally not do for me in that kind of realm? Ah, uh, okay. So I've mentioned how the Singularity command workflow um, exists. You basically just type in Singularity um, exec command name, or excuse me, image name, and then whatever commands you want. So in my mind, a perfect world would have this. So an MPI implementation of this would be as simple as prefixing all of that with an MPI run command. And so that was really the target. That was the, that was the example that I was going for. So if you wanted to run, for example, um, a particular MPI job that exists inside of a container, you really do just run MPI run, you know, number of processes or whatever other features and parameters you want, and then singularity, exec, container name, and uh, your MPI program that exists inside that container. Now, what's happening on the back end is a little bit more complicated than what it looks like on the front end. What's happening on the back end is this is a hybrid MPI approach, meaning part of the MPI exists outside the container and part of the MPI exists inside the container. And I can explain this a little bit, and I'm hoping that, Jeff, you're going to kick me if I make any mistakes or cor at least correct me nicely. <laughs> so basically what you end up with is when you call MPI run, you're on the host, and you call MPI run, and it's going to basically fork off um, the ORTED process. And the ORTED process is going to fork off um, the number of processes necessary for each one of the um, hosts uh, that it needs to run in order to basically satisfy your, your, your minus NP requirement for your MPI run. Then it's going to exec whatever program that you specified at the command line. So if it was just an MPI program, it would basically jump into that MPI program. But if it's singularity, singularity now is going to build up the container necessary for that MPI program, the, MP, the, the singularity container that you specified, at which point it's going to launch the MPI program within the container. The MPI program is going to link against the MPI libraries that exist inside that container. 
Now those MPI libraries are basically going to do everything that they need to do on the, at that end, basically link against all of their other SOs and shared objects and whatnot. And then they're going to make a connection back to the original ordered process via PMI or PMIX. Um, that is basically that closes the loop. Okay, so you you pretty much blew my mind with all that stuff, but it it sounds like it it works at least better than any other sort of system I've seen before, which is kind of hecka awesome. Um, which <laughs> I, like I, 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 I don't really give that kind of praise that often. Um, the different question, though, is is how does... Can I have more than one of these? I, I guess there's no reason. I can have more than one singularity container running on a single host at a time, right? I can have two different people running their two different singularity images doing their own thing on their own subset of the machine that was given to them by the batch system. That all, that all works. Oh yes. Oh yes. Um, there is a consumable, um, in singularity and that is because we are using image files to mount up those image files. You need to basically use a loop device. And by default, most Linux distributions max out at eight loop devices, but you can change that into the hundreds and thousands if you want to. But by default, um, yes, it will consume a loop device for each container that you want. Now, if you're using an MPI run um, and you're going to run, let's say, 20 of these MPI jobs per host, it will just use one loop device for that container because there's no reason to, to, to bind it to additional loop devices when it's the same image. So it tries to be smart about that, but um, there is a consumable involved, so you got to be careful. I found out about Singularity through actually an announcement on the Exceed list. At SDSC San Diego has actually deployed this on their Comet system. Um, if people wanted to try this out, what other systems around the country are kind of commonly available that Singularity is working on today? That's a good question. Um, I don't know all of them. Um, I'm surprised every time I hear of a new one. Uh, there is, I know that there's an in initiative right now uh, at TAC, um, getting it on Stampede. Um, and I know SDSC has put it on a bunch of systems. I know Stanford has it on a bunch of systems. And I know there's a bunch of other universities kind of around that are that have, that have done this. And I know of some European centers as well. But um, I don't know if they've made announcements, so I don't necessarily want to um, spill the beans. But at the same token, uh, I'm, it, I'm just massively blown away by the uptake and how fast the uptake has been on singularity as a matter of fact it's making me a little bit nervous so <laughs> um uh, which is a good nervous i mean only because uh you know i'm uh, yeah yeah probably enough said on that <laughs> well at the beginning of this before we start recording actually you kind of dropped a nice little bomb on me saying that you can actually use singularity inside continuous integration systems and uh, we use that a bunch in OpenMPI development, and we use the, the wonderful free service called Travis. And you were like, oh, yeah, you can use Singularity in Travis. Can you expand on that a little bit? And like, how can I do that, and why would I want to do that? Sure. Um, well, first, I want to mention I'm not a Travis expert, um, but I am using Travis uh, for the Singularity project itself. And as part of the normal um, CI testing that goes on, uh, one of the things that it does is it builds um, build Singularity and installs Singularity, and then it uh, um, will create a new container and then run tests against that container. So I basically took that knowledge that I know it already works in Travis to build containers and to use containers with Singularity with the fact that um, when I'm doing a release of Singularity, I've got a whole bunch of Singularity images, uh, you know, CentOS 7, 6, 5, Ubuntu, Debian, and I go through and build Singularity with each one of those uh, to make sure that at least I don't get any weird build errors um, uh, with any of the features and changes that, I, that I've done. So I'm, pr I'm pretty positive you, you could actually uh, install Singularity into Travis and, or into the, the system that Travis is running on. And then basically just download a few containers. There's a few initiatives right now that are that are going on about how people can share containers and share workflows and uh, define workflows and then use that for scientific documents. Um, basically just saying, you know, go check out this workflow ID if you want to recapitulate everything that I've just done in this whole paper. 
Um, so that's going on right now. That's an initiative at Stanford. Um, but so you could just very easily just tell um, Travis to basically just download these images and then you want to test build inside these images. But I think Travis also supports a little bit of that on the side. But again, as I said, I'm not an expert on Travis, so I can't tell you for sure. Okay, so where can, well, before I'll say that, there'll probably be Singularity running out of system at the University of Michigan here in a couple of weeks. Um, but beyond that, um, where can people find out more about Singularity? There is a website uh, that you can go to, which is just basically some Git pages that we threw together uh, at singularity.lbl.gov. And, uh, but you can also just go there directly via the GitHub page. Um, right now, it's still being hosted under my username in GitHub, which is GM Kurtzer. So if you go to github.com slash GM Kurtzer, uh, you'll see the repository there for Singularity. Uh, so that's probably the easiest way of getting it, or at least the two easiest ways of getting it, uh, getting to it. Hey, one other question that we typically ask people, uh, since you're doing a software project itself, uh, particularly in the scientific community, it's uh, not always appreciated as important, but it is important. What license are you offering Singularity under? Singularity is released under a modified BSD three clause license. Um, it basically the third clause references um, LBL Department of Energy and UC Regents um, explicitly. But aside from that part, it is a standard BSD license with one other exception. Uh, we have a contributors clause that is um, uh, actually in print inside the license. So it basically says you don't have to contribute anything that you do to Singularity um, because it's the three-clause BSD. So you can do pretty much whatever you want with it. But if you do contribute to Singularity um, and you don't specify, uh, or rather you're allowed to specify any license you want for that contribution, but you're giving us a grant back clause that basically says, uh, or it's a grant back license, which basically says that we still have the ability to release the software um, open source um, and basically uh, keep keep everything open. So it's basically a three clause BSD license to users and to contributors. It basically just says that um, we're going to keep your code open if you give it to us. Hey, Greg, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, this was great. Thanks, Greg. Oh, thank you guys for inviting me to this. 